Hey, Steve Manani here doing the Junkyard Crawl at Berniston Auto Wrecking in Berniston, Massachusetts with perhaps one of the most significant post-World War II American automobiles there was, the 66 Olds Tornado. you got to remember that front-wheel drive American cars were a thing before World War II, the Ruxton, the Cord. Uh, but when you get into the post-World War II period, 1966 was the first time a mass-produced front-wheel drive car arrived on the scene. And it wasn't a small compact car. It was a full-sized personal luxury Toro Nato scene right here. 67, the very next year, Cadillac's Eldorado arrived on the scene, but Olds did it first. And here's an example here. Now, this is where the 425 big block would have gone. But again, the front wheels on Toro Nato were the driven wheels. Now, in total, there were 40,963 of these made in 1966. Not a big number, but you got to remember, these things were priced $4,812, which is about $1,500 more than a comparably equipped Olds 442 muscle car. Not that most people shopping a Toronado cross shop the 442. They were mostly looking at Thunderbirds and, and personal luxury upscale cars like that. But again, the Toronado had so many unique features, uh, it's hard to know where to start. It's also the only American car with seven shock absorbers. We'll get to that in a second. But if you look right here, one of the major touches on Toronado was the hideaway headlamps and when retracted just a very sleek front with a minimal grille opening and these were vacuum operated these headlights were in fact there's a massive vacuum canister right here that uh, maintains suction or vacuum if you will so that these go up and down as needed now the engine of course would have been right in here and uh, I'm standing right where the cross shafts and transaxle would have been. These have torsion bars up front. In fact, here's one of them right here. So torsion bars weren't just a Mopar thing. There's one of them sitting right there. The second one's right over here. And this one being a 66 has a single circuit master cylinder. They go to a dual circuit in 1967. But here is Car Life magazine, November of 65, previewing the all new Toro Nato. And this is a, a standard. There was a standard and a deluxe. More on that in a second. We know it's a standard, no trim rings, but we'll get into that in another second. But inside here, we just all these beautiful, this is the expose on all the goodies inside. And there's the frame and uh, it's a body on frame construction right there. You can see the front drive unit, the rear axle is just a beam with leaf springs. Uh, down at the bottom left, there's the engine, 425 Olds with the uh, turbo hydromatic front drive unit equipped next to it. And to the right, that's the Morse chain that actually transmitted torque from the converter into the transfer or a transaxle, I'd say, right here. Now, this whole thing right here, it's kind of an interesting story. It says here, on September 4th, 1962, Ford engineer Frederick J. Hooven was granted a patent on a front-wheel drive arrangement remarkably similar to the one now appearing in the Toronado. Whether Oldsmobile engineers saw this is not important. Both firms' engineers had more or less simultaneously come to the same solution, namely to put the engine in the approximately conventional location and to use either gears or a chain to transfer the drive from the flywheel to a transmission differential assembly along one side of the engine. The Ford Hooven design fed the right-hand wheel's drive shaft through a hole in the engine's oil pan. Olds raised its engine about an inch and a half to avoid this complication. So you gotta wonder, by raising the engine and letting the drive shaft go under the oil pan, did Oldsmobile work around Ford's patent on that front drive situation? Don't know, the lawyers might. But getting back to the fact that this is a deluxe, we know that because we look at the cowl tag and it says style number 396. In this spot right here, 396. If that was a 394, it would be a standard Toronado. The difference primarily is whether it has trim rings or not. And inside, well, let's take a peek there. Let me crawl out of here. Oh, before I do that, I mentioned Toronado has seven shock absorbers. Well, here's the first one. This is a steering damper, and technically it's a shock absorber, but this was here on all Toronados to mute potential vibrations or movements that might get into the steering wheel. Remember, these are front wheel drive cars with over 400 foot pounds of torque. So torque steer and inputs from the front tires, they wanted to mute that from the wheel. So that damper was the first of seven hydraulic pistons or shock absorbers. We'll get to the rest in a second. Let me crawl out of this puppy right here, but just beautiful. These things were strictly two doors, so never any four doors, never any convertibles, uh, but there were some station wagons. We'll talk about that in a second. Kinda. Okay, now we get into the fact this is a deluxe model. Check out the door. We notice that the door handle releases right here on the front. 
okay, the normal location, but on Deluxes, there's a second one right here for backseat passengers to use. So they didn't have to reach around. So this is a, a strictly a thing on the 396 style code Deluxe. And inside, this would have had the Strato bench seat with a fold down armrest, whereas the standard vehicle would have had just a regular old bench, but that seat's gone. But the cool thing about Toronado inside is the flat floor, no transmission tunnel, but also the speedometer and gauge assembly is very novel. A drum type speedometer with 130 mile an hour max, and this thing spun around like that. Only seen in the first few years of Toronado, but again, just loads of novel touches uh, throughout the Toronado. Just really a beautiful car, and I'm really shocked that these aren't more highly coveted and sought after than, uh, than they are. For too many years in the 1970s, I remember my buddies would buy these things and take them on the lake and beat them up and drive them in the woods and, and crash them and destroy them because these things might get 12 miles to the gallon. And when gas went to a buck a gallon in the mid 70s, these things were uh, very obsolete. But today, they're beautiful cars. Now here's the thing, interesting is, this is special interest automobiles right here. This is the uh, July, August, 1976 issue. And again, the Toronado was only 10 years old when they were paying tribute to it here. Special interest auto, of course, is a publication of Hemmings. Hemmings is still very much alive. Hemmings classic car, Terry McGeehan and Jeff Koch and the guys. I love you guys. And uh, this is basically the, the progenitor to uh, Hemmings classic car. But here it is right here. Here's the story of the Toronado. And here's the thing. If you look at the car on the hill, that is a cord, or sorry, yeah, a cord, and the front wheel drive version, if you look at the wheels on that, and then look at the wheels on the Toronado, you'll see that they have a very similar design. That was intentional. John Belts, Oldsmobile's head engineer, was fully aware of the cord's place in front wheel drive history and paid tribute to that fact by designing the wheels with the slots and the same basic look as a cord L29 type wheel. And this is one of those wheels. Now, the thing is, these have a very severe inboard offset. That's because up front, the width of the front drive assembly was so wide that the wheels had to be tucked in. So that's why these Oldsmobile rims are very unusual and they don't interchange with other Oldsmobiles. They just don't uh, want to work. But getting back to this magazine, we can see right here the phantom view once again of what made the Toronado so very cool. And here's the designers in the process of getting that body just right. Now on the next page, I did mention, were there any wagons? Well, yeah. <laughs> These bottom shots here show prototypes, and it says they're old and GM design built several Tornado wagons with low rear floors, tailgate dropped down to bottom of the rear bumper. There was also a two-door, two-seater right here. Uh, in lobbying for a smaller Toronado, GM design staff cut about a foot out of a 69 model, chopped overhang, made it a two-seater. So, you know, often cars that are factory mules or engineering ex explorations don't really count in production but they were made. So yeah, they made some wagons and, and, and two-seaters. Not for you and me, but they were explored and you know, maybe for production, but of course we know it never happened. But we get to the back of this thing and just the way the body tapers down to this beautiful little uh, truncated cam back with the uh, sort of canted jaunty taillights with the argent paint. What a beautiful design. And the thing I love about the first gen Tornados is that they all had dual exhaust and the rear bumper had these cutouts right here for the resonators and twin pipes to pop through. Right there, there's one, and on the other side right here, the second one. And again, these are details that were later picked up on the old 442 Cutlass a couple of years later, but seen first on Toronado. This one has also sadly been kind of abused. Uh, the trunk lid doesn't want to open, but here is the optional vacuum power trunk release. This little thing here, this canister with the rubber line. This right here, you hit a button inside, and that big metal container we saw under the dash, the vacuum reservoir or the, under the hood, would then send some vacuum here pull a lock. You could also use your key if you wanted, but that was the optional vacuum uh, trunk release. Now, of course, if you're a model builder, you'll know that MPC, one of the leaders, designed a Toronado model. These were out in 67. And the beauty here is how they show young minds and old, all the cool stuff about Toronado. You can do a custom version if you wanted, but there's that trans, uh, transaxle right there with the transmission and the 425 engine. And model cars, to me, are one of the great entries to uh, real car appreciation. And kits like that today are 150 bucks, try to find one that's not been built. Now getting back to the old Toronado's seven shock absorbers, we saw one under the hood, the steering damper, and there's one each at the front wheels, but at the rear, there's two per side. Check this out, there's one traditional up and down, 
and this sort of transverse one right there, that is to tame front rear axle judder on hard braking. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven shock absorbers or pistons, if you will, hydraulic pistons on every Toronado. Now this one here has the drum brakes, always seen at the back. Discs were available as an option in 67 up, but again, drums were standard stuff. But the weird thing about Toronado is that these have leaf springs at the back. Now this is GM's patented monoplate leaf spring right here. There's no multiple leafs here. This is kind of like a Camaro or Firebird in a way, but leaf springs at the back. No, they didn't have uh, coils, no independent suspension. It was pretty rudimentary stuff, but it was tuned in such a way that it gave a very subtle, uh, very nice ride. And Cadillac Eldorado also used a leaf spring live axle at the back, which is something that should be out in a buggy. Well, also seen in these things, but again, it's, it sounds worse than it is. These actually give a, an excellent ride. Uh, moving along, we also see more of that beautiful interior right here. And again, we see the crazy dual door latches. And again, seen only on the deluxe, again, for the rear seat passengers to let themselves out without having to crawl over and reach the front one. But again, the flat floor in these things was one of the trademarks and a selling point, really, of the Toronado and the uh, Cadillac Eldorado. And one thing that's often forgotten is the Buick Riviera of this same period of time was based on the same platform. And of course, Riviera's front engine rear drive with a drive shaft tunnel, but a lot of the major stampings were shared between Riviera, Eldorado, and Toronado, even though the Toronado and the Eldorado were the only ones with front wheel drive. So that's the story of America's first mass-produced post-war front-wheel drive car. Not an import or not a little tiny uh, you know, economy model, but actually a full-size prestige car out of Oldsmobile's camp. And again, $1,500 more than an Olds 442 in 66. Which one would you have purchased? They're both cool cars, but it's sad to see this one languishing here at Burniston Auto Wrecking. But I will say that these things are, are coming on, and especially I've seen a couple of these things, factory black, unrestored, original, 25, 30,000 bucks, not uncommon, and they're worth it. Great cars. Well, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mag's YouTube channel, hit the like button, and we'll see you tomorrow with more from Burnson Auto Wrecking as we do the junkyard crawl.